so Kicksat is a project to launch and uh, deploy and test uh, what are, as far as I know, the world's smallest spacecraft. We're trying to make satellites as small as possible, and there's there's a couple of motivating you know reasons for doing that. Uh, a big one is that you know by making them tiny, we can make them cheap, we can make them mass producible, and by having them you know really small and light and all that, they get really cheap to launch. So um, with current technology, we're we're kind of taking advantage of all the electronics out there, thanks to cell phones and Arduinos and things like that, using that kind of stuff, uh, off-the-shelf parts, stuff that you can get as a hobbyist. Uh, we're building boards that are about three and a half by three and a half centimeters, weigh about five grams, and at current launch prices, something that size is uh, a few hundred dollars to launch. That's really awesome. So the original Kicksat launched aboard SpaceX's CRS-3 mission back in April last year? Yeah, so that was um, a Falcon 9 launch. It was an ISS resupply mission that we kind of hitched a ride on. And uh, the, I guess maybe backing up a little, the, the idea there was, uh, so we have these really tiny uh, little spacecraft. We call them sprites. And we built kind of a mothership for them, uh, which was a satellite roughly the size of a loaf of bread, about uh, 30 by 10 by 10 centimeters. And that satellite weighs a few kilograms. And uh, we packed about 100 of our little sprites into that kind of mothership satellite. And that's what actually got launched. So uh, the launch was successful. Uh, Kicksat, which was that mothership satellite, was deployed from the launch vehicle. We made contact with it on its second orbit here in Ithaca. And uh, we had lots of hams and, and amateurs around the world listening in, receiving telemetry and that kind of thing. And uh, the satellite seemed healthy and everything was going well. Um, Unfortunately, uh, due to some, some constraints put on us by uh, NASA, uh, specifically having to do with space debris and that kind of thing, there's some obvious concern with us flinging 100 of these little tiny, you know, untrackable, uh, you know, tiny satellites out, out into low Earth orbit near the ISS. Um, due to some of those constraints, really what it was, uh, there, there were several launch delays and scheduling changes during this whole process. And ultimately, when we launched, we launched very close to another uh, mission, a uh, Russian Soyuz spacecraft that was carrying a crew up to the ISS. And there was concern that um, the launches were too close together and that if we deployed uh, right after launching when we planned to, uh, that the, our sprites would be in the general vicinity of this manned Soyuz spacecraft coming up and we would potentially have some problems there. So um, they made us wait uh, and it came out to something like, uh, I think, 16 or 18 days we had to wait from launch to when we were allowed to deploy our sprites. And uh, the original plan was, was to kind of do it right away and not wait much at all. And uh, we hadn't really planned for that. And that kind of was a last minute thing a few weeks before launch. So what ultimately happened, uh, kicks out the mothership spacecraft orbited for two weeks. And uh, on about day 14, we had a, uh, an unexpected reset of all the avionics, all the electronics in the spacecraft bus reset. We're not really totally sure why that happened. There's a couple of possibilities. One is that it was uh, caused by radiation. Uh, there was some sort of uh, serious activity in uh, uh, the South Atlantic anomaly right around when that happened, so this area of high radiation. Uh, so that could have caused it. It also could have just been some kind of power glitch with the power subsystem. We're not really sure. Uh, but that caused a reset. It reset the entire bus, kind of cleared everything out, and um, we the satellite started transmitting again a little while later. It kind of woke back up. But um, the, the way everything was set up was such that we would have had to make radio contact with it to trigger the deployment again after that. It was kind of on an auto timer before this. And uh, unfortunately, we were trying to make contact with it and, and sort of tell it to deploy. But uh, a few days after, uh, it reentered and burned up. And that was kind of the end of it. So uh, that's what happened. It was a little disappointing. Uh, we are trying again, so we're, we're building Kicksat 2 at the moment. What did you learn from the, the original mission then? What, what was the, the big big lessons? So there were a bunch of them. Uh, uh, on the one hand, we, we did successfully build the spacecraft. We did all the ground testing. Uh, we, we got all that done. We solved all those engineering challenges and all the bureaucratic challenges associated with you know the paperwork and the licensing for cameras and uh, radio frequencies and all of that got done. So I think it was a huge exercise on a learning experience on our part on how to build and fly a satellite and how to get through all the red tape and all that. Um, especially considering what we were trying to do was you know fling a hundred tiny objects out into space that were not trackable by 
you know, NORADs, radars, and stuff like that. So we, we managed to clear all those hurdles and, and get permission from the government and all that kind of stuff. So that was a big deal. Um, and we're going to be able to leverage all of that again. Um, on the more technical side, uh, a number of lessons came out of uh, the architecture of the spacecraft and the problems we ran into on orbit, things like uh, the, the way the radio communication was architected. Um, and we're, we're using different radios this time. Also, uh, another big one was, was knowing time and uh, where we were on the spacecraft was a, was a big factor. And uh, because of some of the rules surrounding uh, CubeSats, uh, the small satellite, which kicks out as a CubeSat, I guess I didn't say that out, out the gate there, but uh, there's, so CubeSats are the standard for small satellites. Uh, there's a bunch of rules associated with them. One of them is that they have to be completely powered off with the uh, batteries disconnected from the rest of the spacecraft when it's on the launch vehicle. And because of that, you can't have a clock running. You can't have anything, uh, you know. So you basically, once you're deployed from the launch vehicle, you're kind of lost in space. You don't know what time it is. You don't know where you are. And it's really hard to figure that stuff out without any kind of absolute time reference or external reference. So essentially you're in a position where you have to tell the spacecraft where it is from the ground. Um, and, uh, and that can be hard. Uh, specifically if you're power constrained, this is a problem we ran into. So if you, if you have limited power on the spacecraft, it costs power to turn a radio on and listen for a, a signal from the ground. And just because of the geometry of how this stuff works, uh, you've got a thing in orbit, you've got the Earth spinning underneath it, right? Uh, it turns out you only get maybe one or two five-minute passes over a given ground station a day. So given the odds here, you're, you're getting maybe 10 minutes out of 24 hours where you can actually see the satellite. And the satellite, uh, you know, it's draining its batteries trying to listen this whole time. So uh, the situation we ran into is that we just didn't have enough battery power. The timing just didn't line up. So the thing's flying blind, doesn't know where it is, and it's trying to listen for you. And you know, you're just waiting for these things to kind of align. And uh, it doesn't always line up very well. So just kind of that collection of constraints. So the, the message here is what we're doing differently this time is we're putting a GPS unit on the spacecraft so that as soon as it wakes up, it can get a GPS fix, know where it is, know what time it is, and know exactly when it's going to be over our ground station so we can talk to it better. I was under the impression that above a certain altitude, the GPS units you could buy off the shelf didn't function. That is totally true. Uh, there's a bunch of international treaties governing this stuff. Uh, there's something called the Vossenar Agreement that says, yeah, it's, I believe it's uh, something like um, 60,000 feet and a certain velocity. There's this treaty that, yeah, so the idea is to keep GPS, commercial GPS units from being used on things like cruise missiles. Um, so yeah, that is a problem. And because of that, we have to kind of hack together our own custom GPS solution. Um, we're using... Uh, some off-the-shelf parts and kind of hacking the firmware on them and stuff like that. Um, so we are, it is legal for us to do that because it's a research project and we're, we're a university and all that stuff. We're just not allowed to sell it or export it to anybody. So, so yeah, that is, that is a big problem and that is why we didn't have GPS on, on Kicksat 1 because it was, you know, something that was a big problem to bite off and we'd have to figure it out on our own. So you mentioned Kicksat 2. Um, it was recently selected for launch by NASA's CubeSat in initiative. Could you tell us about yep. that? So NASA has a program called the CubeSat Launch Initiative, also known as uh, ALANA. That's what it was called last time, I guess. It's uh, Educational Launch of Nanosatellites. Uh, so they award free launches to uh, at least US-based universities and, and educational institutions. So uh, basically, yeah, th this we applied for a launch uh, saying, here's what we want to do. and uh, they decided it was worthwhile, so they, they gave us a free ride. That's pretty awesome. So um, while most of the sprites re-entered with the original Kicksat, you did recently get some back that had spent some time in space? Yeah, so that was another project that actually predates all of this Kicksat stuff. Uh, we've been working on these really tiny spacecraft, the, the kind of sprite idea, for a long time. Uh, going back to, uh, I think, around 2007 or so is when that stuff started here at Cornell. And uh, we had a chance a few years ago to actually put a few um, on an experiment that was headed for the ISS. So they actually wrote on an experiment called MISI-8. It was a material science experiment where they had samples of various you know, high-tech materials, carbon fibers, things like that, and they were trying to expose them to space and see how they, you know, how they held up, more or less. And there was some space on that experiment, so we actually got to stick three of our sprites on that experiment, and they were mounted on the outside of the ISS for uh, over two years, just hanging out in space. And those were, uh, so that went up on the second to last space shuttle mission, actually, back in 2011, and came back on CRS-3, the same uh, mission that 
that uh, Kicksat 1 was launched on when it returned carrying cargo. So that was pretty cool. So we got those back, and unfortunately, because of where they were mounted on the ISS, they were actually on the side facing out into space away from the Earth. Because of that, we couldn't pick up any signals from them. Uh, but they did actually survive. So we've got three of them back, and they uh, at least two out of three work perfectly. So we kind of took them out, shined a sun lamp on them, they transmit and, and work. You know, So that, that was actually very cool. It, it showed that the components we're using on these things can survive in, in the space environment. They can survive the radiation and lower orbit and all that stuff for long periods of time. So they were actually active during the two years they were on the ISS? You just couldn't see them? Yeah, they were, they were, so they're solar powered, and as long as they see sunlight, they get powered on and, and start to do things, and they were programmed to, uh, to transmit and all of that. It's just that because they were mounted on a giant hunk of metal, you know, with a, kind of a big space station between us and them facing the wrong way, we couldn't actually pick them up on the ground, uh, so, yeah. That's pretty awesome. Um, so, Kicksat 2 is fairly far advanced right now. You, you have a launch slot, although I don't think you know when it is yet. Yeah, so uh, we know that we are, we're kind of in the queue for a launch, and uh, we're not sure exactly when that's going to happen or which particular launch will be manifested on yet. Um, I think there's going to be a little bit of back and forth there with, uh, so there's several other, other teams who are also awarded launches in this kind of round of, of that uh, CubeSat launch initiative, and I think everybody has kind of ideal orbits they'd like and, and timelines and all that kind of stuff, so I think that has to all get hashed out, um, and hopefully though we'll, we'll be flying sometime in 2016. I'm not sure. So it's probably about a year away when we'll actually fly at this point. Awesome. So many successful crowdfunding project creators come back to the platform for their next project. You didn't do that with Kicksat 2. Why didn't you? So uh, we actually, during Kicksat 1, uh, we built spares of everything. So we actually had about three of every piece to the spacecraft. Uh, so we have enough to build almost two full Kicksats at this point and, and spare parts and all that kind of stuff. So uh, really, at this point, what we're trying to do is um, we're, we're making a bunch of minor changes to the design, uh, mostly on the avionics and the, the, the mothership spacecraft to kind of get around some of the problems we talked about earlier. Uh, but uh, mechanically, and we're not really changing anything. And, and really, the goal was to have a quick turnaround and, and put these things together as fast as possible and fly the thing again as fast as possible. And uh, we, we didn't really need a, a bunch of additional funding to do that. Uh, the launch is free, we've got most of the parts, so it's really just kind of labor. And uh, I'm at a university, I have undergraduates working on the project, that labor's free. <laughs> um, so, and I'm, I'm funded through other, you know, I'm, I'm funded by the university for now at least. So um, basically it came down to not needing the money at this point and uh, wanting to get this done fast. And, and Kickstarter um, is kind of a, it's a lot of work, it's kind of a full-time job for about three months or so. so it, you know, just because of priorities and timing and, and the fact that we didn't really need it, um, I, that's that's more or less why. I would totally do it again in the right circumstances, and you know, it was a, it was a great experience. So. Beyond Kicksat two, then is there a Kicksat three? Is where where do you go? Uh, I guess it depends on whether that this one is a has successful deployment or not. Yeah, I think it depends a lot on uh, how successful this one is. Uh, I think there's a bunch of different ways this whole idea could go, this idea of sort of ultra-cheap, ultra-small satellites. Um, I think one of the things that I really like about this whole idea is that it can put space flight in the hands of, of hobbyist amateurs, pretty much anybody. I mean, um, right now, with the cost of everything we're doing, it's costing on the order of $1,000 or less uh, to put one sprite in orbit. Uh, that's how much it costs to do this. That's including if you bought the launch commercially, and, uh, you know, all that kind of stuff. So it's putting this stuff within what's, you know, the realm of possibility for a, a whole bunch more people than, you know, what's historically been. Even with CubeSats. So CubeSats were, you know, this big revolution in, in space flight and enabled, you know, people at universities and all this kind of stuff to do uh, space uh, missions. But they still are on the order of a quarter million dollars to, to build and fly one. That's cheap. Usually it's more than that. Um, so, so I think this, you know, is, is a couple orders of magnitude less money to do. I think that's pretty cool. Um, and we had a huge outpouring of, of uh, support from hobbyists, uh, a lot of hams, a lot of people who are just kind of in the maker-hacker community uh, who are really into this idea. And I, I don't know if, if maybe there's a way to make it commercially viable just on that, but I, I think it'd be super cool to be able to you know, buy your my first satellite kit, you know, at, uh, and, and put this thing together and, and, you know, with parts from SparkFun and, and, uh, and then send it away in the mail and, and get it launched or something. I think that would be super cool. Um, actually, during Kicksat, uh, we had a bunch of hobbyists 
pulling down telemetry data from the spacecraft and around the world. Because like I was saying before, you know, over a given spot, you only see it a couple times a day for a couple of minutes. So uh, to sort of get the, the decent amount of data coverage, you actually need a lot of people spread over the whole world listening. So we had that. We had a, a few dozen people actually all over the world. We are actually running the mission from a Google group. Uh, so people would post to the group when they uh, received telemetry packets, and then we had people on there, just on their free time, parsing the packets and pulling the data out and putting into spreadsheets and making plots of battery voltage and all this kind of stuff. We had people on there actually doing re-entry predictions. We had a guy in the Netherlands who got really good at uh, doing the orbit mechanics and uh, uh, predicting you know, when the re-entry was going to happen, and he actually got it, he got it really close. He actually did better than NORAD uh, with the re-entry prediction. So I mean, it was a really, really cool thing to see. Just this this uh, community of people who were you know doing this for fun, not getting paid, you know, just because they thought it was cool, uh, coming together to make this happen. And I that was probably my favorite part of the whole thing. And I, I hopefully you know want to repeat that and, and get even more people involved this time. So I don't know if that's a self-sustaining model for doing this stuff, but I think it's really cool. And I'd love to see kind of more hobbyist hacker involvement in in space. And I think uh, the the bringing this to kind of uh, smaller, cheaper, faster turnaround, uh, you know, realm makes that all possible. Uh, so, so that's kind of one angle on it that I, I'm particularly, you know, into. Uh, that's really awesome. Thanks for talking to us. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks for having me.